Creative insurgents. Creative insurgents. Hey, everybody, this is Corey Huff with the Creative Insurgents podcast. And this is Melissa Dinwiddie, and we are all about living a creative life according to your own rules. And hi, I'm Minnie! Hi, Minnie. Yay. Hey, everybody. Um, we're so glad uh, that the Creative Insurgents podcast is finally live and out there. Um, it's been a few weeks. Uh, by the time you see this, it'll have been a few weeks, and we're very happy with the reception that we've got. Some great feedback. Uh, the show's just going to get better and better, so thank you to everybody who is watching and, and having a good time uh, right along with us. Um, very, very excited today uh, be for a number of reasons. Um, Melissa, you got some cool stuff that happened. We talked about your Facebook auction before. Um, you had some cool news with uh, a large sale. Why don't you tell us a little bit about yes, that? Yes, I do have some pretty cool news. So this is this is the reason to put your stuff out there, even when you're scared to do so. At first, I started doing Facebook auctions with my art, and I've now sold a couple of pieces on Facebook that way. And somebody who subscribed to my newsletter and went through my free program, Creative Sandbox 101, sent me an email out of the blue saying, hey, I am interested in purchasing some of your ArtSpark artworks. Can you tell me how to go about doing that? And I said, yeah, sure. Which ones are you interested in and how many? She emailed back 22 of them. <laughs> <laughs> so in one fell swoop, I sold 22 of my artworks. Yay! That's amazing. <laughs> <laughs> that is that is really really incredible. It just yeah. it, it it it's a testament to the way that you've put yourself out there, Melissa, authentically, and and the way that you've made your your work and yourself available to people. So congratulations and uh, good on you. Thanks, Corey. And also, it made me realize that the reason that she wanted to buy twenty two is she wanted to give them as holiday gifts to friends. Uh, who she thought might appreciate a piece of my art more than a scented candle this year. And so I thought, ooh, holiday promotions. Good idea to think about anybody out there who's looking to sell your stuff. Yeah. Um, awesome. Yeah, I love it. That's that's fantastic. And that's a great quote, too. Uh, art is way better than scented candles. <laughs> Definitely. <laughs> um, so So let's talk about how much I love Ireland. Um, Corey, how much and, do you love Ireland? <laughs> I love Ireland so much. It is, it is. Uh, even though I've never been there, it is one of the places with which I am totally and completely obsessed. Um, Ireland is one of those countries in the world that has way more influence than its size or the number of people that live there. Um, I, the, the number of famous artists and uh, writers and other people that have come from, from Ireland, including Yeats, George Bernard Shaw... Uh, yeah, Ian McDonough, Brian Friel, uh, I can go on and on and on about these amazing writers who write this beautiful prose and uh, wonderful artists. Uh, there was a movie that came, and, I'm, and I'm, I totally love uh, Celtic lore and, the, and the, the, the old stories of the Fae and the Pixies. And I, when, when the movie Secret of Kells came out a few years ago, I've seen it like 15 times. Yeah, um, <laughs> me too! Um, so when I, when I had an opportunity to correspond with today's guest, Richard Hearns, um, I kind of freaked out. I kind of geeked out a little bit. Um, because not only is Richard from Ireland, but he's also an abundant artist. He's living uh, an amazing life. He travels all over the world. He uh, has had a number of solo shows, uh, both in Ireland and in New York. Um, he's 33 years old, and he's been living and supporting his wife from his paintings since the age of 24. Um, he's working on his 18th solo exhibit in Dublin and his fourth solo show in New York uh, coming up in the spring, April and May of 2014. Um, so Richard, is he's a joy to talk to, and I'm very excited uh, to have him here on the show today. So everybody say hi to Richard. Hey, Richard. Hey, hi, guys. Richard. How are you? Good. Great to have uh, you here. Thanks a million. Thanks for the invite, Corey. And, and just on that, I wanted to just congratulate you on all the hard work and the focus and determination that you obviously have with your work as well. So really, I want to just say well done on all that you're developing there. Um, Melissa, I'm not familiar with all you've been doing, but I'm sure you're just as productive. And I just <laughs> wanted to say congratulations to you both. I think you're great. 
Thank you. Thank you very much. So what I was saying is there, there are some interesting things going on uh, for you as an artist, both personally and professionally. Like you've had uh, write-ups in some great publications, uh, both in Europe and stateside. Uh, you've had some influential gallery owners talk about you, and you've been called all sorts of things like important and most important and most promising emerging artist. Um, there's some great quotes going on about it's heavy, you. It's heavy. It's heavy stuff. <laughs> um, and we're going to get into that. We're going to talk about how that feels as an artist because there's there's a good side and a, and a, and a difficult side to it. So mm -hmm. before we get into that, though, I want to ask you how, do you, how did you create and maintain the relationships you have with these gallery owners and critics? Yeah, well, you know, I suppose, as you know, relationships are a very complicated thing. So... They, they, uh, they're really they're forged by nour nourishing, um, you know, and growing with the people, and relationships can be tricky because people, all people, are different and they have different backgrounds and different uh, different ideas about things. But basically, the relationships that I've nourished and that have nourished my career over the years have been just relationships that I've built on over time and. Um, I've involved myself with these people, I've updated them, and I suppose the same would go for my media contacts, and um, they would start with a kind of a preliminary introduction, and then I would just keep in touch with them and keep them updated on my progress. You know, it's it's not true lack of trying, Corey, if you know what I mean. It's, you gotta, you got to work hard at this, at this thing, and uh, like I said, everybody's an individual, so... Um, that's what makes it all exciting, though, because you get to deal with so many different people. When you say that you are keeping people updated, uh, what does that look like? Do you have like a spreadsheet of people that you keep in contact with regularly? How do you organize that and, and remind yourself to do that? Um, I just, I think through the painting, you see, there's a lot of silence when you're working. Mm -hmm. And then through the painting, there's a whole dialogue going on, okay, between you and the painting. But also... Um, at times there's background noise and things come into your head so I keep a really old-fashioned diary mm -hmm. um, actually I even write the dates and the days in myself it's just a notebook a blank notebook but I fill it out um, I suppose I'm very good at short-term planning long-term is more something I could improve on but um, I think through that dialogue of painting and the silence that I have through my work, I kind of realize things come into my head, like little, little, little prompts, and I realize that I haven't been in touch with so-and-so. And now there, I have literally hundreds of contacts all over the world, but I just know, I, I just know um, while I'm working of different people I, I, I contact. So it's, it's a little bit random, Corey, but that's the way I work. Yeah, excellent. Thank you. It's mm -hmm. it's interesting to hear how each artist goes about promoting themselves and how they they stay organized in their business. Look, I've tried spreadsheets and stuff, but oh my god, it just doesn't work for me. I I find like I put so much effort into filling all this uh, detail into these things that after that I'm I'm gone. I'm bunched. I can't do anything else. <laughs> Mm -hmm. It just it just doesn't feel right. It's not organic enough for me. It just it would feel better if I do stuff just on the cuff, off the cuff, if you know what I mean. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Now you've uh, you've got some good relationships with uh, some filmmakers and document and people who have made documentaries about you. How did that mm. kind of stuff come around? Um, well, the the national broadcaster here in Ireland, they did a documentary on me in 2010, and um, that happened through an email I sent out about my work practice and I happened to be in a very interesting studio at the time. It was actually a pre-famine co cottage. Mm. So it was, oh. yeah, this is like, this is like a pre-famine village on the west coast of Ireland in the southwest that dates back to, the cottages date back to about the 1820s and um, it's a very interesting residency for pl artists to work, and there's seven cottages in this area. So I knew that RTE, the broadcaster, would be interested just in the place itself because of the heritage there. So I approached them, and then they decided to do um, a documentary on 
on my work um, at that time. And what was that um, like? And then I suppose um, it was it was daunting. It was daunting, Corey, because it, this is also daunting, you know. Just but but it's it's not as bad. This is more like meeting friends, mm -hmm. but um. You know, when there's lights and microphones and stuff, it is difficult, and you start to hear your own voice through the, you know, feeding back to you and stuff. It's It was new to me, but I, I think I'm starting to get used to it now a little bit more. I'm a little bit more comfortable with it. Why do you choose to have a blog? What do you get out of it? Okay, well, first and foremost, okay, a blog operates on many, many levels, but I'd say first and foremost, it's a point of contact with people. And then it's a fabulous way for me to archive my progress, um, as well as see my discipline evolve over the years as well. So, okay, I, I use it selfishly, first of all, because it actually shows me where I've been and where I'm going, or it points mm -hmm. the way to where I'm going. And then it's a fabulous point of contact. So people can't say to me, you're never in touch with me, et cetera, et cetera, because through Facebook and through my blog, I'm constantly updating people so they do see that I'm there and then if they want to get in touch, they can. But, but first and foremost, it's for me really, Corey, because it is, it's an archival process and it's a wonderful thing. Yeah. yeah. So how does it work as an archive? How is that different from a personal journal? Oh. Um, I suppose it's very similar in many ways. Um, I, I back up, you know, I back up my, my blog every once in a while and stuff just because if anything happened to a blogger at the domain or whatever that it's mm -hmm. held on, I'd be really distraught. Um, it, it functions just like a diary, Corey, and, and it enables me to improve my writing as well as my thought process, as well as it disciplines me in regard to my output. So... I hope that's answering your question in a roundabout way, I suppose it is. It is, I, yeah. I love that answer, Richard. I think that's so great for any artists out there who are listening because I know that one of the one of the questions that Corey and I get all the time in our program Art Empowers dot me is what do I blog about? What do I write about? And mm. you have just said point blank, it's like a diary for me. It's yeah. charting my progress. It's just like mm. a it's like a personal journal. Yeah, and absolutely. lo and behold, people are interested in that. I mean, particularly if you can write it in a way that is engaging, right? But the way that you develop your skill at writing in a way that's engaging is by doing it. So I, yeah. love, I love that. It's very savvy. And I also just want to, for one moment, I want to go back to what you were saying about how you got that documentary, mm -hmm. how you got them to, that relationship developed. You talked, you're very savvy, Richard. You talked about bringing the attention of the producers to the location because you knew they'd be interested in that. And I yeah. think anytime we're interested in spreading the word about what we're doing, it's really smart and savvy to figure out what is newsworthy, what's of interest around us that might be somehow connected to what we're doing, but not not specifically the thing we're doing. Like, I, for example, this is a bit of a side tangent, but I know that um, there, a, a lot of times artists will hook up with charities of various kinds and use that together. A charity on its own can never get any press and artists on their own can, are, it's very hard for us to get press, but combine them together and all of a sudden it becomes news, mm -hmm. right? So yeah, you figured absolutely. out a way to make something interesting and newsworthy from what you were doing. So anyway, sure. I back think, to what I think about. In, 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 and I think I, I can see, I can see exactly what your, what your, um, what you're talking about there, and, and you're so right. I don't think in retrospect that I actually knew what I was doing, but I can see how that worked for me at the time. But I think I was so enthusiastic about being there, about the place, and about my work in that space, that I think that enthusiasm came across, and that's why they were interested. Well, and yeah. passion and enthusiasm is always yeah. compelling. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I have to say, like, so many artists say, oh, I don't want to sell. I hate selling. I hate, like, trying to sell myself. Enthusiasm is selling yourself. Like, if you can talk to people and just let them feel the same way that you feel about your thing, that you, you won't have to sell anything because your natural enthusiasm will sell it. Anyway, I've got a big house, but it's definitely not big enough for all my paintings. 
So I got. I have to move them. You know, you can't keep them. <laughs> hey, Minnie, did you have a question? Oh yeah, oh, I do. Minnie. Well, hi, hi, Richard. Hi. So, yeah. um, I was thinking about like as long as we're talking about neat places that you love to travel and you've traveled before and you've been to Thailand. Wow. That's right. And yeah. he did some stuff from there. So I was wondering what you got from that, and if you decided to travel to do art, or if you decided to um, do art and then travel. You know. Yes. Can... Oh, this is an interesting question, I Minnie. Mean, really interesting because when I was a young man, when I was younger man, when I was 19, <laughs> I think I knew. Um, from studying with a Thai ceramic artist in college, I was introduced to Thailand at the age of 19. And I think I realized that Thailand was a place that I could live and develop my work um, cheaply over long periods of time. So I used to make a body of work there and spend a few few months. And you could live there for $250 a month, like $200 a month. That wow. would be a house at the beach, uh, three square meals a day, you know, a motorbike so you could go around, you know. Um, bye! Bye, it was I'm off to Thailand! <laughs> <laughs> it's got a bit more expensive, Minnie, but Minnie, no, come you back. should go. You should go, Minnie. Oh, okay. So it was somewhere I could, I, I knew I could afford to live and work as a young guy, and that's what I did. So I'd make a body of work, and then I'd return to Ireland, and I would have a show, and then I would go back on the proceedings. That was the plan. Course, that was the plan. That was the plan. <laughs> and it worked out, thank God. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Thanks for the question, Minnie. Richard, you you have uh, like you you sell, you know, large originals and you sell small studies and you have all kinds of work for sale. Um, yeah. but I also noticed that you are getting ready to uh, start selling prints. Uh, yeah. your website has a, you know, I'm I'm going to be selling prints page. Yeah. Uh, there's a concern that a lot of artists have. They say, oh, you know, I, I don't want my prints to devalue my, my originals. Mm -hmm. um, you want to talk a little bit about your thought process and in, in why you're going in the direction you're going? Absolutely. I mean, I, felt, I feel like a lot of those artists um, in the sense that making... I always wanted people to have an original painting of mine that would never be reproduced. So, and, and that's what I've kept at. But over the years, Corey, I've had so many requests for, for reproductions, for lithographs or glique prints of my work. And there are some fabulous print studios in Ireland that I could go into as a working artist and work with some very um, able-bodied printmakers who are artists also, and maybe come up with a lithograph or something. I know there's a lot of very, very well-established older artists in the country here that do that, and they do it very well. They produce books and they produce lithographs. To be honest, I have it up there because I'm waiting to receive a lot of requests for it before I do it, Corey, because I am adamant that each of my paintings will be a one-off original. So the paintings will always... Um, you know, retain their value and uh, continue to 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 be be valuable for for the for the people and the families and generations that have them. So, it's a tricky thing, Corey. It's a tricky thing. I, I I'm not keen on it yet, but I am keen on printmaking. So I can see myself maybe in a couple of years uh, taking a and going to a print studio and maybe working there for a period of time. Awesome. So Richard, I have a question about that. It sounds like, and tell me if I'm wrong, it sounds like mm -hmm. your plan regarding the, the reproductions, the prints, is to perhaps have a particular painting or a particular series of paintings that are only available as prints. Is that what you're thinking about doing? Yeah, that's a possibility for one of them, uh, that for one body of work perhaps. Mm -hmm. um, I'm also. I've also. I have this really, really large commission on at the moment by um, a, a world a petrochemicals company have commissioned me to do this huge commission, and I wouldn't be surprised if they want reproductions of that work also. So there's a couple of different angles I'm approaching it with, 
but I would like to make specific work for reproduction but most of the requests I've been getting from people are reproductions of paintings that are already in private and public collections. And ha have you already decided that, that, that you won't reproduce any of those? I haven't made up my mind 100% yet. If yeah. you have any uh, <laughs> If you have any ideas there, you can you feel free to shoot shoot them by me, Melissa. I don't I don't have that much experience in that area. It's really tricky. I, I, the kind of work that I've done as a professional artist, primarily, you know, that I've sold primarily, has been specifically for clients and customized for them. I make Jewish marriage contracts and other wedding documents, in addition to all kinds of other work. But that's that's the business, the first real art business that I built up. And when I started selling prints, it was very strategic, very business-minded, because I crunched the numbers, and I realized that, yeah, I could make thousands it's a of passive dollars. passive income. Well, not, not entirely passive, but much more passive. And, I, and, and it's, if I sell an original, I might make thousands of dollars on that one original, but I don't make any recurring income from it at all. So it's, mm -hmm. you know, very time intensive and then boom, it's a great big chunk of money but then it's gone. Whereas if I make a pr if I make prints, I can sell multiple times. I can sell, you know, exponentially more dollars worth <laughs> of that art than if I sell yeah. it just as an original. But it's a complete it's a really different market. You sure. know, then the, I think that the you know, the wedding market is so different from the general art buying market. And yeah. so I was, you know, when I made the decision to sell prints, it was from that perspective. And I think it's really different if you're, if you're a painter, a fine art painter, then it's, yeah. it's, it's, it's really different. Yeah, I think you're right, Melissa. And um, my work, I would, I would want to stress that my work has never had a commercial value in a sense for me. It's like each painting is a one-off and it's not, usually I wouldn't work on commission. I wouldn't work on paintings for something but that I would make pieces and then I've been fortunate enough that these pieces have found collectors over the years. Yeah, yeah and some of my work it's has been that way as well and some right. of it has been specifically made for you know to the specifications of particular clients Then okay. I got smart and I realized that that was making me crazy and <laughs> and also <laughs> if it's if it's to the specifications of a particular client it's not always gonna work for another client right you're okay. not always gonna want a cat or you know whatever sure. this couple has asked for so I got I got more savvy as I went along and only took on commissions that were you know generic enough that I could sell them to anybody okay. and, spec yeah, and yeah. specify that in my contracts as well you commission me to do a piece great and I'm I'm probably gonna make prints of it and you need to be okay with that otherwise it's gonna cost you a lot more so that's another another tack that I took that great. if it was only going to be a one-off then it would just the price would go up a lot. Sure. One of the things that uh, that I hear from a lot of artists is that uh, you know parting with an original piece of work can actually be a little bit tough sometimes. And and when you start to get noticed for it and people start writing about you, um, it can be sort of an overwhelming experience. Mm -hmm. And there's this great quote on your website from uh, a woman named Miriam Dugan. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'm just, I'm just going to read this quote, and then we'll talk about it. Um, for Richard, painting is about connectivity, seeing beneath the humdrum and daily to the deeper realities which underpin our lives. His work is full of a sense that there is something more, and it's this fundamental belief that makes his work hopeful without being trite. Antoinette Sinclair describes him as having an unfaltering enthusiasm for his subjects. He is resolutely optimistic. Mark Redden believes that he is searching for an idol, while Richard himself describes each painting as a fragment, a glimpse of something which might be beautiful. How does it feel to have people writing about you and your work? Yeah, it's... Um, I, I can't stress how important it is to have people write on your work, Corey. I think it's very insightful for the artist, because... Um, your eyes grow tired, of course, seeing your work, and you approach it from a very personal perspective. So having someone else write on your work um, can be a catalyst to open new, new beginnings and present you with a new uh, philosophy or a new vision or a new insight. 
-hmm. So I think it's really important. I love it. I mean, I'm, I, I am absolutely thrilled when people say they would like to write on my work, or, or I meet people who are scholars, and like, when I meet people like that, I just, you know, that's the one of the first things I, I think is I really would like to bring them to see my work, and um, perhaps they might be kind enough to write something on it, you know. I think I think what it does is it gives you a perspective. So like when I know when Mark Redden, uh, he's actually he's an artist himself. When he uh, wrote, he he works and lives in Barcelona now. But when he wrote about my work and he said that I was searching for an idol and uh, that there was a spiritual sensibility to my work, um, and he also said that there was a triangular history, which was like my travel it was all about my travel how I kind of move between these different areas like it was very insightful for me so then when I came back to the canvas and I was making paintings you know that dialogue was there with me so it, I think it enriches the paintings as you go along I'm not sure that it steers you in a different direction but you're more you're just you're just in the mode you just you realize that these things are happening in your work and uh, it might give you an extra little bit of confidence or something like that mm. in your work richard i'm i'm curious the the praise that you've gotten being called the most promising most important emerging artist in ireland yeah. what kind of effect has that had on you that 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 sounds rather um like it could be a lot of pressure <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it could. I mean, I don't take it literally. I, I mean, I don't. I mean, there's so many fa brilliant artists in Ireland. And God, when I go to New York every year, it's like, wow, I think you guys are operating at the, like, the highest level. It, definitely when it comes to the visual arts, anyway. Corey, I know we're the best at theatre. Just get over it, because you're <laughs> never going to get there. But... Uh, <laughs> And we really are. We're, we are. We are scholars when it comes to literature, but um, in regard to the visual arts, you know, I have a lot to learn. I look at the Spanish painters and I'm blown away. I just think it's in their blood, much like writing is on, in our blood here in Ireland. But uh, mm -hmm. it it doesn't. I don't let it affect me really. But I'm delighted that people would say something like that about my work. So you're, it sounds like you're able to stay pretty neutral about it. Yeah, definitely. Richard, thank you so much. This has been a really enlightening conversation, and I feel, um, I don't know if it's the Irish magic, but I feel uh, enriched for this conversation. Um, you, normally well, we would have a quick tip here, talk with you uh, where we give people a, a quick... Uh, yeah, thank you. Normally, normally here we would have a quick tip where we would give people a short piece of actionable information. Uh, Richard, you have this beautiful poem written by a, an Irish uh, writer. Uh, I'd love to tell, tell us a little bit about it, and then why don't you ahead and read it for us, and that's how we'll sign off today. Okay. Well, um, I decided because in regards to Ireland's lit literary genius, like you said, um, that I would read from a poet philosopher who came from the next village to where I live here in the Burren. <clears throat> he came from a village called Fenor. And he was a wonderful man. He, he died young. He passed away, I think, at the age of 53, not so many years ago. But his name is John O'Donoghue. And I think his most famous book was a wonderful book called Anam Cara. Uh, Corey, Melissa, and, um, and Minnie, I would advise you to, to get it, just to read it. It's a beautiful um, book. So um, the, poem, the poem I chose, Corey, is called... Um, it's called For the Artist at the Start of Day. Um, I, I hope it won't bore you. It's not so long. I'll, 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 I'll get through it straight away, okay? I'll get stuck in now. Okay, so it's For the Artist at the Start of Day by John O'Donoghue. May the morning be astir with the harvest of night, your mind quickening to the eros of a new question, your eyes seduced by some unintended glimpse that cut right through the surface to the source. May this morning of innocent beginnings, when the gift within you slips clear of the sticky web of the personal with its hurts and its hauntings and fixed fortress corners. A morning when you become a pure vessel 
for what wants to ascend from silence. May your imagination know the grace of perfect danger to reach beyond imitation and the wheel of repetition deep into the call of all the unfinished and unsolved until the veil of the unknown yields and something original begins to stir towards your senses and grow stronger in your heart in order to come to birth in a clean line of form that claims from time a rhythm not yet heard that space calls to a different shape may it be its own force field and dwell uniquely between the heart and the light to surprise the hungry eye by how deftly it fits about its secret loss and that's it wow that was beautiful thank you beautiful Thank you very much. I might just uh, clip a record, clip that recording, and just have it on my computer to listen to. Oh, I love it. Yeah. yeah. Thank you, Richard. Uh, Richard Heron, so welcome. much. Yeah. Um, thank you, th Corey. Yeah. That's that's our show today, everybody. Uh, we'll leave you with that poem to consider. Thanks for watching. Bye. Bye. Thanks, Leah. Thanks, Melissa. Thanks, Minnie. <coughs> bye, bye. <coughs> I have to dance again now. Oh. <laughs> you have to dance again. <laughs>